time with Stephanie Story. Hi, I am art historical novelist Stephanie Story, and this is my show, Story Time. My guest today, her her debut novel came out on the same day mine did, April seventh, twenty twenty, in the middle of the pandemic. Yes. Uh, it's called The Pelt and Papers. We are going to talk about it. We are going to talk about the artist behind this book with uh, my guest today, Mari Coates. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the show. Well, welcome Thank to the you. weird virtual world. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> it's getting more and more real the longer we go on here. <laughs> Right? It is starting to get to like, oh wait, is this going to be what the world is still going to look like? <laughs> really, yeah, it's kind of strange, but uh, we're getting a little more comfortable with it, I guess. I, I, I guess. Okay, we will talk about the pandemic more later because okay. I, I think all conversations end up leading back to there right now. <laughs> but first, much more importantly, your beautiful book about this beautiful artist. Uh, before I ask you about your particular connection to her, because you have a family connection to her, tell my at-home watchers why they need to know about Agnes Pelton, just from a broader, like, why she's important, because I did not know about her before this book. Well, she is representative, really, of a tremendous number of women artists who have stayed in the shadows as, uh, as male artists have, have broken through. And that is a truth. It's not just a knee-jerk kind of lib thing. It's true. And she has been someone who over the years has been discovered kind of over and over again. And people are, where did, where was she? I never heard of her. And so that's been going on. This particular, the, the well, part of the reason that my book came out in April 7th, 2020, <laughs> like yours, um, is that she is. She should be kind of in the middle of a landmark solo show, which is presently stalled at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City. Started in Phoenix, the Phoenix Museum of Art went to New, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is parked now at the Whitney. Um, should have ended June 28th, but they thankfully are holding it over until fall. So I hope, hope, hope I get to go see it there because that really means a lot to me. And then it will end in Palm Springs, California, um, Palm Springs uh, Museum of Art, probably late fall and maybe through the winter months. So that's, that's very exciting. But she's, she's a person who uh, was one of the very early American modernists. Um, she studied with Arthur Wesley Dow, who was himself uh, a modernist uh, pioneer. And Dow is the person, besides his own art practice, he was also a painter, but he is really best known for his teaching. He taught Pelton, he taught Georgia O'Keeffe, he taught scads of artists um, through the early 1910s. And what he did was transform the way art itself is taught in schools, art schools, and how art teachers are taught. He taught first at the Pratt Institute where Agnes studied with him, and then moved to uh, Columbia Teachers College and then the Art Students League, I believe. But he, he focused on design and composition rather than copying a painting, trying to learn from another artist by copying the way they paint. Dow focused on design. You could, he, he loved Japanese prints. And when you look at Japanese prints, they're elegant compositional masterpieces fitting a wave into one little sheet of paper like that. And so she, she was one of his early students. Um, she was one of his protégés, really. He wanted her to come and teach with him. He hired her to teach at his summer school of the arts in uh, Ipswich, Mass. Um, she hated teaching. She looked like, well, you see the cover image is her at about 
20, which was about how old she was when she was hired by Dow to go up to Ipswich and teach teach women who were bored in the summer and wanted to learn how to draw, except they wanted to learn from him. And they thought that she was too young and they made fun of her for not, you know, anyway, so she hated all that. Um, but she she was part of the early wave of modernism in, in the U.S. And she was part of the, the signature show of modernism in the U.S., the show at the New York Armory in 1913, which was the first time that modern art was shown in America. And so people were outraged. They were seeing things like Duchamp's, you know, the um, new descending a staircase, which is this fabulous cubist thing, a bang, 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 somebody, you know. And they were outraged. They thought it was insanity. And, and they thought that anybody involved with this was possibly criminally insane and you know, other things. But she was part of that show and that was her first, um, her first step over into fame that never really materialized. So that, that, that show was also part of making modernism what it is. I mean, exactly. and that is really what sort of kicks it off. So how does she miss her moment of fame? Is it just because she's a woman? Were there other contributing factors? Oh, there were, there were many contributing factors. She, she was a very shy person. She was um, contemplative by nature and eventually retreated to the California desert where she, that's what she did. And, and her, her modern picture, her abstract pictures are, are vehicles of the spiritual visions that she would get when she was practicing her contemplation. Um, she, she was a woman, yes, that was a problem, but she was not she was not one to push herself out really either. Um, she was also the child of scandal. She was part, her grandmother and grandfather and her mother as well were uh, associated with the biggest 19th century scandal um, really around. And it was uh, called the Beecher Tilton scandal. That Henry Ward Beecher was a preacher, a very famous one in Brooklyn, where they all lived, and um, and he had an affair with Agnes's grandmother Elizabeth Tilton, and this this was such a wild time. It was such a wild time. This was the 1870s. And they're all talking about free love. These people were all abolitionists who had succeeded. They had gotten the slaves freed. And from that, they stepped into let's free everybody. So they were talking about free love, free this, free that. And it was scandal, scandal, scandal. But what happened, there, there was a publication in New York um, called the Wood... Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly, and Victoria Woodhull was a famous journalist, and she would say terribly scandalous things about all the men she was having affairs with and this and that. Free love, you know, and she, she would say all kinds of things, and people would be, you know, screaming at her in print, and she wrote this column and said, I don't know why everybody's so upset with me. Beecher and Tilton are doing this right now. And so it, so there it was out in public. So that caused B Tilton to sue Beecher. He was embarrassed and he sued Beecher for criminal affection with his wife. There was this lawsuit and, and Elizabeth, the subject, one of the subjects of the lawsuit had said, had told her husband that she had had this affair with Beecher. It was over by then. And Beecher was terribly upset. And, and this trial went on for six months, six months with the tabloid press in New York City hitting it every day. And by the end of the trial, when they put Elizabeth on the stand, she was, she was too, she was a, a small, shy, very religious woman who couldn't bring herself to, to say on the stand, that she had had this affair with her minister. So she denied it. And therefore they were completely ruined. 
Um, Elizabeth retreated to her home in Brooklyn, put up drapes everywhere. She never went out. Nobody ever came in. No guests were ever in their house. Um, they had no newspapers. Nothing came in, and she never went out. Um, Agnes's mother came back, had been in Europe studying music, and had married Agnes's father there and came back to New York to live with her mother and um, and started a music school. So a Agnes was, was shy and by temperament and by training taught to avoid the spotlight. So she did. And she still worked. She, she painted all the time. She was part of many shows in New York. She, was, she had something like 40 paintings in a show by a group called the Introspectives, mm -hmm. which is where symbolism is beginning to emerge. Um, and she had, uh, everything was in front of her. So she, she, after her mother's death in 1920, she retreated from New York. It was kind of like she was finally free to leave because she really didn't like the scene at all. And she moved out to Long Island. She went first in the summer of 1921 to start what became a business for her, a portrait painting. And she painted all kinds. She was friends with my grandparents. That's that's where <laughs> we pick up with her. And, um, and she painted portraits. This behind me, maybe you can see this. I was going to ask about that painting, so I'm glad yeah. you are, you, you are oh, showing it. I can't name it very well. I'm really not good there with it. Go. There you go. You got it. Oh, good. That is my grandmother in 1921. And painted by Agnes? Peg, painted by Agnes. And she painted that same summer. She painted... She first painted my grandfather, whose painting is with my cousin, his grandson. Um, it, that was done in New York. And then out on Long Island, she painted my grandmother. She painted my mother at age 10. Um, and she stayed on Long Island. She loved it. And what she did was paint portraits in the summer and then start studying in the winter. She was very, very, very interested in mystical studies and psychology and theosophy and and that's what she did she, she she kind of painted in the summer for to make a living and then retreated to her thoughts and her studies and began to began her quest really for her own style of abstract painting and um and, and she wasn't really interested in fame, really, at all. She was interested in finding the way to translate in painting. She was kind of a disciple of Kandinsky, who believed, you know, she had his book, The Spiritual in Art, and he believed that it was possible to connect certain symbols and to construct paintings that would, in fact, transport the viewer to that particular spiritual experience that the artist was having. And so that was her quest. I love watching you talk about her because you are so passionate about her and her art. And you, I mean, your heart is in this and I love it. <laughs> Yeah. And and I don't think that just comes from growing up with someone's paintings around their house. There's something else. There's some other bond. Do you know why you became so enraptured with her and her work? I, you know, I just always felt a connection. My mother, I used to, my mother used to do these massive house cleanings fall and spring. And she would change the drapes and the rugs and all this stuff because we didn't have air conditioning. It was really, really, really hot in New Jersey where I lived in the summer. And this was the 50s and 60s. And most lot people were getting it, but we didn't have it. We really couldn't afford it. We had all this beautiful stuff in our house, but no money to do anything else. Um, and so I would help her with her big cleanings and she would tell me all about the things that we had. And when I was 10, my mother, uh, I guess my dad got a raise or something and, and that led my, allowed my mother to have um, cleaned and restored the portrait that she had, that, that, that Agnes did of her when she was 10. Now that one is a full-size portrait. 
it's, um, it's very large. And when she put it up in the house, I looked exactly like it. <laughs> and so people were coming over saying, oh my goodness, I didn't know you had Mari painted, you know? <laughs> so I kind of loved that, but um, it was, I just had this connection with her and my mother would talk about her as Aunt Agnes and talk about how wonderful it was to stand. And, and she would tell, she painted children a lot. She was very good at it. And she told stories to the kids. So she had a, she just had a warm heart, I think. And I was always interested in her. And I was also fascinated with my grandfather who was really her friend. Um, first and then my grand, both my grandmother and grandfather. My grandfather died before my parents were even married, but my mother was particularly close to him. And he was an amateur historian and he was an amateur photographer and one of the first people to really think about taking pictures for, for artistic purposes, but his were always of family. And so he has, there's a bunch of albums that are now in the New York Historical Society Library, which I've been to visit many times. They're beautiful. But I was so interested in him and always wanted, wanted to know more about him. And there's papers of his in that library too. So I started getting very excited about him. You know what kills, this is what kills me. The facts of people's lives, the your life, my life, Agnes's life, my grandpa, people who are just people really, and they have thoughts and interests and passions and and they care about things. And if they're if they're really lucky, like Agnes and my grandfather were, they can put things down on paper in such a way that it comes alive for people and they live and breathe again. And that's kind of how I felt about him. And I started working on, I was trying to write fiction about him. And that was, yeah, just didn't sing really. And then I thought, well, I, you know, then I, then I found out about her abstract work. And I thought, whoa, I've got to bring her into this. I don't, you know, I'll bring her into this novel I'm writing, which wasn't it wasn't at all but that's you know <laughs> and and so I tried bringing her in and she just took over she was talking to me in a first person voice and that's a very powerful <laughs> connection and I just started listening to her and it was a little it was scary at first because I thought oh gosh what if I've got this wrong I didn't I didn't explore the primary sources early on because I was so afraid. I was afraid of inadvertently plagiarizing somehow. Um, I didn't want to just start writing something and then be told by somebody else, oh, you just quoted Agnes Pelton exactly, you know, and that just wasn't my interest. So I waited until I had quite a good deal of material written. And then I thought, well, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, and that could be, um, I'm going to change your name because I really love this character. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did look at the Pelton papers on the, at the Smithsonian, which are available for interlibrary loan or museums, education departments have them. I did that here. And it, it was her voice. It was her voice. So <laughs> that, was, that was satisfying. And, and then also carried with it more responsibility because, okay, now we're really writing about a real person who had definite opinions about things and, and don't mess it up. You know? <laughs> so. Right? There is. There, there is a special pressure that comes yeah. from that. But if you avoided primary sources for a long time and you tried to stay away from them and you tried to let this own voice create itself in your head, how do you think you got it right? Was it because you'd heard stories about her? Because you'd been looking at her art? What, how do you think you tuned into that without having studied the primary sources a lot at the beginning? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, 
to some degree, it might have to do with some of the things I was doing to, to try researching this. I started taking a class in drawing just to find, I have a friend, a dear friend who's a brilliant, she's a brilliant artist and a brilliant teacher. And I thought, I'll just sign up for this class at our city college here. And I was shocked and kind of horrified to, well, when you got to class, you're, you were told to go out and buy this gigantic pad of newsprint paper. What is it, 26 by 34? So, I mean, it's enormous. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> and I was really scared of it, but I didn't stay scared because my teacher was brilliant and she showed us how to make how to make marks on a big piece of paper. And I was, I was trying to think about Agnes and I used, to re, I used to write on my way to work. I live in San Francisco and I worked in Berkeley and I took the uh, BART every day, the train. And um, that was a good 20 minute ride. So I'd bring along a nice pad of, I like yellow paper <laughs> and start writing in longhand and and this voice said something to me and it really it, it was my thought too it was like i want to make a big drawing on big paper and it just sort of expanded out for me and i said okay let's you know <laughs> i'll listen you tell me what you want and and we kind of that was kind of how it started but there was so, her life was so full of interesting, interesting aspects. And that, and I love history. And I love looking, I looked at photographs, old photos of Brooklyn. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a New Yorker at heart. Old photos of the city. And then the Smithsonian has old photos of her. Um, in this old studio that she had down on 13th Street, I think. It's just wonderful. They're just transporting to me. So I had these photos that I was looking at. I had this wonderful catalog from the first exhibit um, written by Michael Zakian, who was the curator who gathered abstracts he, he was hearing from people right and left and collecting these paintings that he was the first person to show as a collection like that and um, he wrote a wonderful wonderful biographical account of her life and and i would just go back and read that for a while and then i would stop and because there was it was packed it's so compact it's it's compressed beautifully but it is so rich and her life was so rich and that was hard and that's probably why it took so long to write because it did okay that's what i was going to ask so when you started this conversation you said one of the reasons why it was coming out this spring was because it was in conjunction with this big solo exhibit that she had Mm -hmm. So how long did it take you to write this novel? And did you actually plan for it to come out in conjunction with that? Because like I worked for years to get my Raphael novel to come out at this, at, in conjunction with the 500th anniversary of his death, which was in April 2020. Right. Did you have that same process where you were working toward this goal or was it a little bit of luck? Like, how did that work? Oh, it was luck. I mean, it was it was weirdly Agnes's luck because every time she had a big exhibition or something, some something entirely out of her control would happen, a war, stock market crash, things like that, that had nothing to do with her and everything to do with who would come and see the thing. But I started writing this um, sort of seriously into i'd started writing sketches and i and those were very alive to me and many of them are still in the book and um and it was just too hard you know what it's hard you know that and i know that it's really hard <laughs> so i thought i can't do this maybe i'll get a story out of it so i pulled out the things that i liked and i put them in a story and that wasn't published either, but you know, I thought, oh well. The nice thing about, and you, I'm sure you'll agree, the nice thing about being a writer is if you have a really good day, 
it's on paper and you can keep it for yourself and to show other people. That's a really helpful thing. Um, but I started writing it. I started committing to it in 2007. I had a reading um, and I, and I, the thing that I had planned to read didn't work out at all. So I pulled out some of these little bits and read um, for my, I'm a, I'm an alumna of Warren Wilson um, MFA program for writers, and there's a summer conference every year, not this year, but every year. And, um, and we do readings um, as our entertainment. And so for that, I pulled out some of these and, and it was so exciting to revisit them again. And I just, I just, and, and it was so well received. And I just thought, I have to do this. I have to do this. So in 2007, I said, all right, I'm going to do this. But I wasn't, pl I was planning to take about a year or two years to do it. I wasn't planning on dragging it out this long. And, um, and I was terrified that some other smarter, better writer was going to whip in, discover Pelton, and come out with a novel about her. Because I sort of felt like, I don't think there's a huge amount of room for, <laughs> for more Pelton novel. You know, I just don't think that's good. And I'm a nobody. I'm a complete nobody. So... I just kept working at it and I quit a couple of times and then came back to it. I had a writing group, God bless them. Oh, God bless them. And I would send them a chapter every month and, and moan and groan about, oh, this is so awful, you know, and they would still be interested and still encouraging. And that was, that was essential. I couldn't have done it without them. And eventually I stumbled to the end of a first draft. Oh my God, it took me years. And then had a couple of people, oh, my best friend, Helen in Boston, Helen Fremont, whose book came out this year too, her second book, um, read ev all these versions of it and we started paring it down. And um, finally it got pared down to where it was possible. and. And that's at the point at which I, I learned about this exhibition. And I thought, oh, we have got to get this now. It has to be spring of 2020, because I think we were in 2018 at that point. And she writes press, which is an independent press in Berkeley, were soliciting, they, I found them under a website, 30 Best Independent Presses, and they were actively soliciting for spring 2020. And it was so unusual to see a publisher asking for manuscripts. <laughs> they, you know, it just was. And I thought, well, maybe I can do that. And um, so I submitted it there and kept trying, you know, other, you know, agents and, you know, all that stuff. And they accepted it immediately with um, first tier status, which means you're, oh, this is good, you can, we'll just publish it the way it is, which is very nice to hear. But then I got a very helpful, helpful comment from, an, from a very kind agent who actually read it. He read the whole thing. And he just didn't think it was a big enough book and um, so he said no, but he said he was really enjoying it very much, but he, I had some apparatus that I thought was clever. And he said, I was just kind of bored by that and I wanted the story only, you know, and I thought, oh, that's, been, that's the problem. Oh, thank God, you know. So I, so I took away all of that apparatus that was so clever and um, and just stripped it down to the story itself. And um, and that is the book we have. And I'm so grateful to him because I'm really proud of the book and uh, grateful. Okay, I do have one more question I have to ask you though, because you referenced earlier that you used to be on the bar traveling in for a job. Now I know you were a theater critic. Yeah. Was that your job? What? What kind of a, a, of a job were you doing to prepare you for this noveling career? Um, well, I, I found quickly, I was a theater critic and a freelance arts writer. And temperamentally, I am so unsuited to that. I really need a secure job. And um, 
friend of mine asked me, are you getting writing done or are you just thinking all the, and I was obsessing all the time about who I should be pitching to and all that. That's, I just, so I looked and looked and looked for a job and finally found one entry level position, please. But that's how they hire everybody at University of California Press, which is in Berkeley. And that is a large scholarly press, which is a wonderful employer. <laughs> so that was so helpful because it allowed my life, it gave my life stability and it gave me a job that was both interesting with fabulous people. I loved the people I worked with. I loved the books we worked on. We did a lot of art catalogs. Um, so, and I was the assistant to the managing editor and because she outsourced most of those for production, we didn't, they're very expensive to produce. So she outsourced that, but I had to check all the page proofs and stuff. So <laughs> imagine sitting at your desk and having to read a book about the artist Joan Brown say, you know, it was just wonderful. I loved it. And I loved um, the kinds of books that came, that we handled and dealt with and the opportunity to read about artists that I didn't know. I didn't know Joan Brown. I didn't know half the people that we were producing catalogs for, mm -hmm. but that sense of a, of a vibrant, alive world of artists working, Art is hard, hard work. And, and painters are devoted people and they work extremely hard. And I loved that. And I loved that aspect of it. So I would say that UC Press had as much to do with my writing about Agnes Pelton as Agnes Pelton did. Thank you for, for, for the writing you do and for joining me here today and talking about art. I could not have enjoyed listening to your passion more. Story time with Stephanie. Story, story time virtually. We've got time and plenty of stories. Talking stories in a novel way. Story time with Stephanie. Story.